In this video, we're going to talk about solving multivariable limits using various algebraic tricks. If you're more interested in single variable limits, I'll link my Calculus 1 playlist down in the description. Now, in our first video on multivariable limits, we actually looked at when a limit didn't exist. And one of the big takeaways was that if you approached a point along different paths, then it may have different values. And we had this sort of two path test to show that a limit didn't exist. But how do you show that a limit does exist? You could check, for instance, 10 different paths or 100 different paths or a million different paths and still not know that you missed one of them. So in this video, we're going to see how we can use some algebraic trickery, some limit laws to actually answer a wide array of multivariable limit problems. Let's begin perhaps with one of the easiest examples I can think of, one that actually doesn't need any algebraic tricks at all, one that we actually can just substitute the values in. This is a limit of some function, and I do want to pay attention to that underneath the limit sign we write that x and y, the pair x and y, are going to some point, in this case 1, 2. Now if I look at this function, there is a y in the denominator, which could be problematic if y was 0, but because we're sending x, y to the point 1, 2, the problem spot in the denominator is nowhere to be seen near this point 1, 2. And as a result of this, we just plug the values in. The answer is going to be, well, 3 times 1 squared, which is 1, plus 1 divided by 2 times 2. This all cancels to be 1. Now, why does this work so nicely? Why am I just allowed to plug it in because there's no problem slot, for example, in the denominator? Well, what's really happening is that we're applying a list of limit laws. So let's state a few of those. I'm going to begin by supposing that the limit of f of x and y is x and y goes to some point a, b is called l, and that for the function g of x and y go to the same point as m. Then I can state the following rules. The first one is sort of an additivity rule. It says, if I take the limit of the sum of two things, then that's just the sum of the two limiting values, the l plus the m. Likewise, the limit of a difference would become the difference of the two different limits, l minus m. Similarly, we could talk about what happens if I multiply. So the limit of f times g is just, well, the product of the limiting values, l times m. We can divide in much the same way, although there is one caveat in division, which is the denominator has to be non-zero. So if the g of x and y goes to a non-zero value of m, then the limit of a quotient is just the quotient of two limits. And the final one maybe I'll put on this list is about scalar multiples. If you take the limit of k, times some function, it just goes to k times the limit, k times l. Now what's worth noting here is that all of these limit laws are true under that supposition, namely that the original limits, the f and the g, that both of those existed at this point a and b. If that initial assumption wasn't true, then these limit laws are likewise not true. Indeed, we studied limit laws more or less exactly like these back in Calculus 1. We saw all the single variable equivalents of them, and so I'm really just stating all those old laws you thought were true are also true for multivariable functions. I'll note that in this video we're not really giving the proper definition of a limit, the epsilon, delta, sophisticated formal definition, and so I'm not going to prove these laws, but if one wanted to dive into the epsilon, delta definitions, then all of these laws would be provable from that sort of more sophisticated technique. Nevertheless, for our purposes, we've stated these laws and we can move on with our lives. So let's return to that trivial limit, as I'll call it at the beginning. The reason why it was trivial, the reason why it didn't need any algebraic tricks, and the reason why we could just plug the numbers in, is that it is a combination of, well, elementary things. It's a quotient, and we've seen, well, we know how to deal with quotients. You just do the top and the bottom individually. If I look just at the top, well, it's the sum of two things. We had an additivity law. You can do each of those two things individually. If I look at just the x squared, well, this is kind of like x times x. We've seen all the way back in single variable calculus that the limit of just x, when you take some value of x to some point, say a, is just going to be a. So indeed, this expression is just a combination of different additions and multiplications and quotients of things that we know how to do, and so we can just sort of plug it in. And in practice, for most of these relatively simple limits, you just glance at it, you say, is there any problem spots like a division by zero or a square root of a negative? And if their answer is no to those for these sort of simple rational functions, then you just plug in the numbers and that's the value of the limit. Okay, but what happens if it's not so simple? Consider this particular limit. Okay, so what's going on here? The first thing I want to investigate is what's happening underneath the limit sign. 
there's the point x, y going to the point 2, 3. That's just saying I'm trying to get near the point 2, 3. Now let me focus a little bit more on that denominator. If you just plug in 2, 3 to this, you can check. It's 0 on the top, and it's 0 on the bottom. In both cases, it's 0. So I can't use any of those laws. I'm going to have to do some algebraic manipulation first. And the thing that we can do here is factor the top and factor the bottom. So, so let's factor the bottom first. 3y minus xy, there's a y on both sides. So let's just go and factor out that value of y, and so I get a y out the front and then 3 minus x. So now I want to factor the numerator, but this is multivariable factoring. So what can I do? Well, when I look at this numerator, I see that there's a y squared in two of the terms and then nothing to do with y in the remaining terms. I also see that two of the terms have an x and two of the terms do not. So one of the things I might try to factor out might be y squared, how about plus 2? Let's see if that works. So I'm going to try to factor out a y squared plus 2, and indeed everything works out nicely. y squared plus 2 times x minus 3, if you multiply all of that out, gives you just that original numerator. So this multivariable factoring is kind of the same basic idea as single variable factoring, but now we have it simplified. Notice there's an x minus 3 on the top and a 3 minus x on the bottom, which is almost the same except for a 9 sign. So I'm going to cancel the two of them. Uh, I have to keep in track that I'm not directly canceling them, I'm canceling them in the way that's going to introduce a minus sign. But when I do cancel them, well, there's that minus sign on the front, and then just y squared plus 2 on the top, and just y in the bottom. Now, while the two functions are not identical, the two limits actually are, because the limit doesn't care about what happens at a specific point, it cares about what happens around it. So even though the term with the two factors on the top and the bottom is just not defined anywhere where x is equal to 3, you can cancel them and it still works in the limit. Now it's a limit that is like the first example. There's no longer a division by 0 anywhere near the point 2, 3, so I can just plug the numbers in, and minus 11 over 3 is my final result. Factoring the top and bottom and cancelling was indeed a standard trick back in Calculus 1, and the same basic idea repeats itself, you just have to do multivariable factoring now. All right, let's look at another example. In this example, we're going to talk about one that has some square roots in it. So again, this limit is going to some particular point. I've chosen 2, 2 here. But I've made the restriction that x plus y cannot equal to 4. If that was the case, and x plus y was 4, then it would be a 0 in the denominator. This wouldn't make any sense. So we're going to explicitly restrict that we're going towards the point 2, 2, but not along any path that ever has that x plus y is actually equal to 4. You might also think, well, shouldn't you also make sure that x plus y is a positive number? Because you've got square roots after all, you wouldn't want square root of a negative. Well, that's true, but if I look at the point 2, 2, the limiting value, well, 2 plus 2 is 4, the inside of that square root isn't remotely close to a negative value, so so in the limit where we only care about values close to 2, 2, we never have to worry about negatives at this particular point. Now, the trick to solve this one, again, if you plug 2, 2 in, you're going to get 0 divided by 0. So you have to do an algebraic trick. We can't apply the laws we saw earlier in the video. Not yet, at least. And the standard trick here is to multiply by the radical conjugate. In the denominator, you have the square root of x plus y minus 2. And so what I'm going to multiply by is square root of x plus y plus 2 on the top and on the bottom. The reason I'm allowed to do this is that multiplying by the same thing on the top and the bottom is just a funky version of multiplying by 1. So I'm allowed to multiply by this. However, it has a very nice advantage when it actually comes to computing this. So let's actually multiply out that denominator. The top, by the way, I didn't touch. It's just the same x plus y minus 4 times that you know, square root business. There's, there's nothing changed on the top. Well, on the bottom, something has changed. Because if I multiply the two square root terms together, I get x plus y. If I multiply the minus 2 and the plus 2, I get a minus 4. And then the other two terms, they cancel. And then when I look at this, it's actually really, really nice because x plus y minus 4 appears on the top. And it appears on the bottom. And so again, I can cancel on the top and the bottom. This is going to get rid of that division by 0 problem I've been having. This is just going to leave me with the limit of square root of x plus y plus 2 on the top. That's it now. And now there's no more problems. As we're going to see in a moment, square roots also play really nicely with limits. And so we need, I can just plug these values in and I get this square root of 2 plus 2 plus 2, which adds up to 4. 
So again, we have an example where a little bit of algebraic trickery has allowed us to cancel the fact that it was a zero over zero indeterminate form, and we've managed to determine the value by plugging in with our laws. Now, remember that list of limit laws with the additivity property and being able to multiply and so forth? I want to add one more to this particular list. I want to assume that I've got a multivariable function f of x, y, and its limit as you go to a, b is just l. But then I'm also going to assume that I have another function, a function g of x, a single variable function, and my single variable function is continuous at l. And I'll remind you that continuous means that the limit of the function is just the same thing as the function value at the particular point. So what I can do with this is construct a composition of functions that is g of f of x and y, and I can take the limit of that composition as x, y goes to a, b. Then the idea here is that g plays nice, because it's continuous, at the value of l, and that the f, the inside, is going towards the value of l. So what is this? It's nothing but g of l. This is actually going to radically expand what we can take limits of. For example, the square root function has the property that it is continuous when x is greater than zero. And so in our previous example where we use that square root, we're effectively just using this theorem. Or as another example, if I want to look at the limit of sine of some messy combination x squared plus y, well, the inside, the x squared plus y, that has no problems. We can use our previous rules on that and just plug in the value that it's going to be pi. And then from what we just said, sine of pi is just zero, and we can just plug it in. It's just a g of l, or in this case, this sine of pi. So the point is that with exponentials and sines and cosines and square roots, as long as your inside is greater than zero, and many other functions, if you knew that they were continuous back in calculus one, then by this theorem, you're going to get continuity of sort of compositions of this nature all for free as well. So we've radically been able to expand the amount of functions that we're now capable of computing the limit of. All right, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below. Give the video a like for that YouTube algorithm, and we'll do some more math in the next video.